Chapter 3. <clears throat> once a knight, always a knight. But once a king is too often. Sir Bella of Eastmarch. Now, I don't think... I don't want you to think I'm a pushover. I drove a hard bargain with the king before giving in. I not only managed to get him to agree to a bonus, but to cough up a hefty percentage in advance before accepting the assignment. Not bad for a fledgling magician who was over a barrel. Of course, once I accepted, I was no longer over a barrel. I was in over my head. The more I thought about it, the worse the idea of standing in for the king seemed. The trouble was, I didn't have a choice. Or did I? Thought about it some more, and a glimmer of hope appeared. There was a way out. The only question was, how far could I run in a day? While not particularly worldly, or off-worldly for that matter, I was pretty sure that double-crossing kings wasn't the healthiest of pastimes. It was going to be a big decision, definitely the biggest I ever had to make on my own. The king, or to be exact, his stand-in, wasn't due to make an appearance until noon tomorrow. So I had a little time to mull things over. <clears throat> with that in mind, I decided to talk it out with my last friend left in the palace. What do you think, Gleep? Should I take it on the lamb or stick around and try to bluff it out for one day as a king? The response was brief and to the point. Gleep! For those of you who've tuned in to the series late, Gleep is my pet. He lives in the royal stables. He's also a 20-foot-long blue dragon. Half grown, half grown. I shudder to think what he'll be like when he's fully grown. Grown. As to his witty conversation, you'll have to forgive him. He only has a one-word vocabulary, but he makes up for it by using that word a lot. Wordy or not, I turned him to him in this moment of crisis because with Oz gone, he was the only one in the dimension who would be even vaguely sympathetic to my problem. That in itself says a lot about the social life of a magician. Come on, Gleep, get serious. I'm in real trouble. If I tried to stand in for the king, I might make a terrible mistake, like starting a war or hanging an innocent man. On the other hand, if I double-cross the king and disappear, you and I would spend the rest of our lives as hunted fugitives. The unicorn in the next stall snorted and stamped a foot angrily. Sorry, Buttercup, the three of us would be hunted fugitives. War unicorns aren't all that common either, even in royal stables. That particular war unicorn was mine. I acquired him as a gift shortly after I acquired Gleep. As I said before, this lifestyle is more than a little zooish. In a kingdom with a bad king, a lot of people would get hurt, I reasoned, and I'd be a terrible king. Heck, I'm not all that good a magician. Gleep, my pet argued sternly. Thanks for the vote of confidence, but it's true. I don't want to hurt anybody, but I'm not wild about being hunt a hunted fugitive either. Tired of verbalizing his affection, Gleep decided to demonstrate his feelings by licking my face. Now, aside from leaving a slimy residue, love you too, my dragon's kisses have one other side effect. His breath is a blast of stench, exceeded only by the smell of pervish cooking. Gl Gleep, oh boy, I managed at last. I love you dearly, but if you do that twice a week, we may part company permanently. Gleep? That earned me a hurt expression, which I erased which I erased simply enough by scratching his head. It occurred to me that dragons had survived because of the, each of them only became emotionally attached to one being in its lifetime. If their breath reached the entire population instead of a single individual, they would have been hunted to extinction long ago. No, it was better that only one person should suffer than... Another part of my mind grabbed that thought and then started turning it over. If I run, then I'll be the only one in trouble. But if I try to be king, the whole kingdom surfers. That's it. I have to leave. It's the only decent thing to... It's the only decent thing to do. Thanks, Gleep. Gleep? My pet cocked his head in puzzlement. I'll explain later. All right, it's decided. You two stock up on food while I duck back into my room to get a few things. Then it's goodbye, Pulsiltum. I've had pause to wonder what would have happened if I'd followed my original plan. Just headed for my room, gathered up my belongings, and left. The timing for the rest of the evening would have changed, and the rest of the story would have been totally different. As it was, I made a slight detour. Halfway to my room, Oz's training cut in. That is, I started thinking about money. 
Even as a hunted fugitive, money would come in handy, and the king's advance would only last so long. With a little extra cash, I could run a lot farther, hide a lot longer, or at the very least, live a lot better. Buoyed by these thoughts, I went looking for J.R. Grimble. The Chancellor of the Executor and I had never been what you would call close friends. Blood enemies would be a better description. Oz had... Oz... <clears throat> Oz always maintained that this was because of my growing influence in court. Not so. The truth was that my mentor's greed for additional funding was surpassed only by Grimble's reluctance to part with the same, literally the same, since my wages came out of those coffers so closely guarded by the Chancellor. I found him, as expected, in the tiny cubicle he used for an office. Scuttlebutt has it he repeatedly refused larger rooms, trying desperately to impress the rest of the staff by setting an example of frugality. It didn't work, but he kept trying and hoping. His desk was elbow deep in paper covered by tiny little numbers which he alternately peered at and changed while moving various sheets from stack to stack. There were similar stacks on the floor and on the only other available chair, leading me to believe he had been at his current task for some time. Seeing no available space for sitting or standing, I elected to lean against the doorframe. Working late, Lord Chancellor? That earned me a brief, dark glare before he returned to his work. If I were a magician, I'd be working late. As Chancellor of the Executor, these are my normal hours. For your information, things are going rather smoothly. So smoothly, in fact, I may be able to wrap up early tonight, say in another three or four hours. What are you working on? Next year's budget and operating plan, and it's almost done. That is, providing someone doesn't want to risk incurring my permanent disfavor by trying to change a number on me at the last minute. That last was accompanied by what can only be described as a meaningful stare. I ignored it. I mean, what the heck? I was already on his bad side, so threats didn't scare me at all. Then it's a good thing I caught you before you finished your task, I said nonchalantly. I want to discuss something with you that will undoubtedly have an impact on your fingers. Uh, on your figures. Specifically, a change in my pay scale. Out of the question, Grimble exploded. You're already the highest paid employee on the staff, including myself. It's outrageous that you would even think of asking for a pay increase. Not a pay increase, Lord Chancellor. A pay cut. That stopped him. A pay cut? Say, down to nothing. He leaned back in his chair and regarded me suspiciously. I find it hard to believe that you and your apprentice are willing to work for nothing. Forgive me, but I always distrust noble sacrifices as a motive. Though I dislike greed, at least it's a drive I can understand. Perhaps that's why we've always gotten along so well, I purred. However, you're quite right. I have no intention of working for free. I was thinking of leaving the court of Posultum to seek employment elsewhere. The Chancellor's eyebrows shot up. While I don't argue your plan, I must admit it surprises me. I was under the impression you were quite enamored of your position here at a soft job. I believe it... I... Uh, in a soft job, I believe, is how your scaly apprentice describes it. What could possibly entice you to trade the comforts of court life for an uncertain future on the open road? Why, a bribe, of course, I smiled. A lump sum of a thousand gold pieces? I see, Grimble murmured softly. And who's offering this bribe, if I might ask? I stared at the ceiling. Actually, I was rather hoping that you would. There was a bit of haggling after that, but mostly on the terms of our agreement. Grimble really wanted Oz and me out of his accounts, though I suspect he would have been less malleable if he had realized he was only dealing with me. There was a bit of name-calling and breast-beating, but, uh, but the end result is what counts, and that end result was my heading for my quarters, a thousand gold pieces richer in exchange for a promise that it was the last money I would ever receive from Grimble. It was one more reason for my being on my way as soon as possible. With a light heart and heavy purse, I entered my quarters. Remember the last time I entered my quarters? How there was a demon waiting for me? Well, it happened again. 
Now, don't get me wrong, this isn't a regular occurrence in my day-to-day -day existence. One demon showing up unannounced is a rarity. Two demons, well, no matter how you looked at it, this was going to be a red-letter day in my diary. Does it seem like I'm s to you I'm stalling? I am. You see, the, this demon I knew, and her name was Masha. Well, hello, High Roller. I was just in the neighborhood and thought I'd stop by and say hi. She started forward to give me a hug, and I hastily moved to put something immobile between us. A hi and a hug might not see, sound like a threat to you. If not, you don't know Masha. I have nothing against hello hugs. I have another demon framed friend named Tananda. Yes, I have a lot of demon friends these days. Whose hello hugs are high points in my existence. Tananda is cute, curvaceous, and cuddly. Okay, so she's also a, an assassin, but her hello hugs can get a raise out of a statue. Masha, on the other hand, is not cute and cuddly. Masha, Masha is immense, and then some. I don't doubt the sincere goodwill behind her greeting. I was just afraid that if she hugged me, I would it would take days to find my way out again, and I had a getaway to plan. Um, hi, Masha. Good to see you, all of you. The last time I had seen Masha, she was disguised as a gaudy circus tent, except it wasn't a disguise. It was actually the way she dressed. This time, though, she had apparently kicked out the jams, along with her entire wardrobe and any modicum of good taste. Today, she wasn't completely naked. She was wearing a leopard skin bikini, but she was showing enough flesh for four normal naked people. A bikini, her usual wheelbarrow full of jewelry, a light green lipstick that clashed with her orange hair, and a tattoo on her bicep. That was Masha. Class all the way. What brings you to Claw? Aren't you still working Jacques? I asked, mentioning the dimension we were where we met. The boys will have to work things out without me for a while. I'm on a little vacation. There was a lot of that going around. But what are you doing here? Not much for small talk, are you? I like that in a man. My skin started to crawl a little on that last bit, but she continued. Well, while I'm here, I thought I'd take another little peek at your general bad axe. But that's not the real reason for my visit. I was hoping you, you and me could do, talk a little business. My life flashed before my eyes. For a moment, neither Oz's departure nor the king's assignment was my biggest problem. Pun intended. Me? I managed at last. That's right, Hot Stuff. I've been giving it a lot of thought since you and your scaly green sidekick rolled through my territory, and yesterday I made up my mind. I've decided to sign on as your apprentice. 